violated the plutonium in the 1960s, Japanese authorities have agreed to get rid of more than 300 kilograms of it. But that's only a portion of all nuclear materials in Japan. 44 tons of plutonium recycled from spent nuclear fuel is stored at facilities across the country. Researchers with the IAEA say that will be enough to produce more than 5,000 atomic bombs. Japanese officials say the plutonium will be used as fuel for nuclear plants. But all reactors across the country were taken offline one by one following the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi. Members of a watchdog group say the sheer number of facilities means the stockpiles are vulnerable to terrorists. And they point out that the nuclear industry lacks a system to conduct background checks on employees. Regulators have agreed to establish such a system, but they haven't decided At the crippled plan. Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have suspended one of their key operations for decommissioning the reactors. They've had some trouble transferring nuclear fuel from a reactor building to a storage pool. Workers were about to lift a container for fuel assemblies, but an alarm went off and the crane stopped moving. The workers have been monitoring radiation levels around the pool. But officials with Tokyo Electric Power Company say there's been no change. Workers started transferring the fuel assemblies in November. They need to move more than 1,500 of them. Most of the assemblies are spent and highly radioactive. Reactor number four did not suffer a meltdown in the accident three years ago, but the building was damaged by a hydrogen explosion. The trouble occurred just as workers restarted a treatment system to remove radioactive substances from wastewater. The system has also been hit by a series of problems. About 400 tons of groundwater flows into damaged reactor buildings and becomes contaminated every day. Members of Japan's ruling party are trying to solve a serious labor shortage in the construction industry. One of their ideas is to expand the number of foreign workers. LDP lawmakers agreed on the need to revise the maximum period for so-called vocational training for foreigners at Japanese firms. They suggested it would be extended from three to five years. We need to utilize the strength of foreign workers to make Japanese industry competitive again. So we're trying to work out a government-sponsored program. Japan's labor shortage has grown to be a chronic problem as society ages. The workforce peaked in 1997 and fell by 1.86 million last year. It's expected to get worse as the need to rebuild the disaster hit northeast grows more urgent. Tokyo is also slated to host the 2020 Summer Olympics and must build new stadiums and other infrastructure. The proposals to increase the foreign workforce is making domestic laborers uneasy. They appealed to the government at a rally in Tokyo to attract more young people into the industry. About 700 people took part. The Secretary General of the National Federation of Construction Workers Union says he welcomes foreign workers as trainees at construction sites in Japan. But he added what's necessary is to improve working conditions to attract more young Japanese and build a sustainable industry. Japan's defense ministry has boosted its IT capabilities. Officials have set up a 90-person unit to protect against cyber attacks. Some security experts say 2013 was the worst year on record with thousands of the country's government sites hacked. Defense Minister Itsunori Ononeda inaugurated the unit. He said hacking attacks are getting more sophisticated. Safeguarding the information systems of the Defense Ministry and the Self-Defense Forces is essential for the protection of Japan's peace and security. Onodera added, it's no exaggeration to say the international community is always vulnerable to such threats. Unit Chief Masatoshi Sato says the risk of cyber attacks is very real, not something from the future. He said his team is united in fulfilling its duties. The new unit answers directly to the defense minister. Members will perform around-the-clock monitoring of ministry and self-defense forces networks and respond to attacks. Leaders of Japan and South Korea have met for the first time since they both assumed office. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and South Korean President Park Geun-hye have been caught up in disputes over history and territory. But they sat down together with U.S. President Barack Obama. NHK World's Takashi Ichinose reports. 
the leaders of Japan and South Korea finally agreed to talk on the sidelines of the nuclear security summit in The Hague. President Obama had pushed both leaders to mend their strained relations before his official visit to the Asian region in April. It is the first time that the three of us have had an opportunity uh, to meet together and discuss some of the serious challenges uh, that we all face. Uh, obviously, Japan and uh, the Republic of Korea are two of our closest allies in the world. President Park agreed that it was a significant opportunity for the three to sit down together. I believe this is a meaningful chance to have dialogue with President Obama and Prime Minister Abe. Prime Minister Abe thanked President Obama and greeted President Park in the Korean language. I want to sincerely thank President Obama. I am happy to meet President Park. Very happy to meet you, President. Their 50-minute meeting focused mainly on the common security threat in the region, North Korea. They discussed the unpredictability of leader Kim Jong-un and the country's nuclear and missile development programs. They also discussed humanitarian issues such as abductions by North Korea. Both Japanese and South Korean nationals are among the abductees. Abe thanks both leaders for their cooperative efforts to solve the issue. The three leaders agreed that it's vital to strengthen security cooperation on North Korea in the region. And our trilateral cooperation has sent a strong signal to Pyongyang that its provocations and threats will be met with a unified response. President Park refused to meet with Abe in the past over historical issues. This included the so-called comfort women who served as prostitutes during World War II. But officials say those bilateral issues are not raised in the meeting. Prime Minister Abe expressed his hope that relations with South Korea can improve. I felt that it was important to meet face to face. I would like this meeting to be the first step to develop forward-looking bilateral relations with South Korea. Officials say Abe hopes this summit will be the first step toward thawing relations between Japan and South Korea. Both governments are preparing for diplomatic working-level talks, but how this will play out is yet to be seen. Who had gathered at that nuclear summit promised to strengthen security. They agreed to reduce their stocks of weapons-grade uranium and plutonium to counter terrorism. The leaders issued a statement urging political and financial support for the International Atomic Energy Agency. Japanese delegates say they'll remove all highly enriched uranium and plutonium from a research facility, and they'll hand the materials over to the U.S. counterparts for disposal. President Obama says the leaders need to do even more. We still have a lot more work to do to fulfill the ambitious goals we set four years ago, to fully secure all nuclear and radiological material, civilian and military, so that it can no longer pose a risk to any of our citizens. Obama initiated the summit in 2010. U.S. officials will host the next meeting in 2016. South Korean Defense Ministry officials say authorities in North Korea have fired off two ballistic missiles. Ministry officials say the missiles were launched from a point north of the capital, Pyongyang. They flew about 650 kilometers, then fell into the Sea of Japan. They say the missiles appeared to be a medium-range model called Nodong. Analysts in Seoul are trying to find out more about the launches and what the North Koreans are trying to do. Pentagon officials confirmed the launch. They said the North Koreans should stop provocative acts and work to improve ties with their neighbors. Japanese Defense Minister Itsunori Onodera has ordered his staff and Self-Defense Force personnel to continue to gather information.
The South Korean and U.S. militaries have increased alerts against North Korea as the country has repeatedly launched rockets and short-range ballistic missiles since last month. North Korea fired rockets believed to be multiple launch models on February 21st. 30 rockets were fired toward the Sea of Japan last Saturday. The United States has condemned the launches as a violation of UN Security Council resolutions. On March 5th, the North Korean People's Army, that's North Korean's People's Army, said it successfully carried out rocket launching drills. It said if the U.S. smear campaign continues, it would lead to a powerful rocket launching well, attack. Five, a rash of Hanford workers have needed medical attention over the last week after ingesting unknown toxic fumes. King 5 investigator Susanna Frame joins us. She broke the story this afternoon and has now the latest. Susanna. Gene and Lori, in the last week, get this, 11 Hanford workers, 11 people have wound up in the hospital or at the on-site medical facility there at Hanford after breathing in harmful chemicals. This is an unusually high number of employees, of course, getting sick from vapors at Hanford in just one week's time. Two employees breathed in fumes that tasted like copper a week ago. And today, both of them are still sick with symptoms such as nosebleeds, chest pain, difficulty breathing, headaches, and even coughing up blood. Then today, one week later, nine more workers ingested fumes and needed medical treatment. While it's unclear exactly what the workers inhaled, we do know that nuclear waste stored in underground tanks at the Hanford site generate toxic vapors, and these fumes are making their way, have made their way through filters that are supposed to protect workers there. And Hanford has a duty to protect the workers at this site. They are doing an important cleanup, and yet their lives and health are being sacrificed, uh, you know, for money because they don't. The companies aren't spending the money to protect them. We did talk to several workers at Hanford today that were very upset because they say there's not any monitoring systems, no um, pieces of equipment on the ground in those what they call tank farm areas to be able to detect chemical vapors. But we did get a statement uh, late this evening earlier this evening from the company. Um, this is a statement from the government contractor in charge of all the underground tanks. All 11 employees work for them. Uh, this company said they do have a program to monitor chemical vapors and that they've made improvements in recent years to reduce those exposures. And we're going to have more on this tonight on King 5 News at 11 o'clock.